Hello, folks. This is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Watchman Studios with another Watchman video broadcast. We are continuing our series on Matthew 24, Mark chapter 13, Luke chapter 21. We're talking about the end days or the last days. Now, there's something I want to say uh, before I go on with what we're going to look at uh, for the next couple of weeks. Uh, we've started out in Matthew 24. They're asking Jesus about, you know, when's this temple going to come down, you say? And, you know, what, what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And he starts out with all these things, you know, many shall come in my name saying, I'm Christ. And we're going to talk about the wars, the rumors of wars today and so on. And understand that these things that we've been talking about so far and the things that we're talking about today, all of them happen before what he says in verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days. He didn't say seven years. He didn't say three and a half years. The tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds. Very, very important. Of heaven with power and great glory, and he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet. They shall gather together his elect. And yes, I do believe that that is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God. The dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive shall be caught up together um, with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51, Behold, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all change in a moment. Excuse me. Behold, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible. We shall be changed. So I believe that everything that I'm talking about happens before the translation Jesus appearing in the clouds, we will meet him there according to the scriptures. These are things I believe are happening before we're translated. Jesus called them the tribulation of those days. And I believe that. I believe they are, we've, we've talked the last two weeks about the time of trouble and the day of trouble. And it is absolutely going to be the most troubling time that the earth has ever seen. A lot of people are troubled right now over what's going on in our country, what's going on in other countries. Uh, what I heard from somebody the other day, they'd, they'd seen this, I think, on sermon audio or report. Uh, the number is different. I'm not sure exactly which. Some said 18%. Some said 30%. But at the most, only 30% of the churches in America are gathering on a weekly basis to have church now. Folks, that ain't right. It's not right, and it's not going to be good. But I will tell you, what I think is happening could very well be the way a shepherd divides sheep from goats. It's the way a, a, a someone who is out harvesting divides wheat from tares. It's how someone can determine who is the children of light and who is children of darkness. I think it's a way that God separates those who are truly faithful and those who never were. 
because those who are truly faithful, we don't need a church service to keep us that way. We're going to remain faithful no matter what happens. If all hell is unleashed, and we know in Revelation 9 it will be, then God's people are still going to remain God's people. And nothing that happens in this world can change that. And yes, it's thundering right now as I'm speaking. So let's get into what we're going to talk about this week, Matthew chapter 24, verse 8. Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. You shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. We're going to talk about that. See that you be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Then notice what he said. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines, and pestilences, and earthquakes in divers places, and all these are the beginning of sorrows. Now, there's a lot in this verse, and obviously, you know me, I'm not just going to say, well, we read this one verse, and let me talk for 45 minutes and not give any more verses. We have a lot of verses to go through. There's several things here about, you know, them, the beginning of sorrows, and what does that mean? What does the word sorrow have to do in the Bible? How is it defined in the scriptures? What is nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom? Um, he said, see that you be not troubled. Now, I can tell you, I already am. I already am. You know, every now and then, I am aware that the lions have encamped against us here at Bethel. And years ago, you know, when lions were trying to get at me, my thinking was, you know, I, I've got to stand strong for my wife and my children and for this little church that God gave me. And now, it's much larger than that. It's my wife, my children, my 14 grandchildren, all of their families, all the people who come to church here, all the people who church with us every Sunday, every Sunday night, Wednesday night, twice a week PMO, who are online, and this is around the world, that all the people who listen to us on the radio station in Kenya, and all the people that we've made sure they've had plenty of food to eat. So when lions, when I detect the lions now, there's a lot more people that I'm concerned about. And I go to the Lord. It's, I'm doing, I'm, I think God is training me in the days that are coming. What to do? What are we going to do? People ask me all the time, what are we going to do? If they come by and get us and the government's going to take away our guns and what are we going to do? And I think God will show it. God, there's no doubt in my mind God will teach us what to do. In fact, I think he's doing it now. He's teaching us how to pray. He's teaching us how to trust the scriptures. That's what I think he's going to do in that day as well. Okay? Let me read the other two passages of Matthew 24, of what we just read. The companion is uh, Mark, and then, of course, Luke. Luke says a little bit different thing. Whereas Matthew said wars and rumors of wars, Mark says wars and rumors of wars, Luke says something different. Take a look. Luke 21, verse 9, But when ye shall hear of wars and commotions, be not terrified. For these things must first come to pass, but the end is not by and by. Then said he unto them, Nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and great earthquakes shall be in diverse places, and famines, and pestilences, and fearful sights, and great signs shall there be from heaven. Now, we kind of know what some of those great signs are going to be. He talked about that in Joel chapter 2, Acts chapter 2, uh, Revelation 12, I believe, are what those signs that's going to appear. I, I think they're defined by what's in Revelation chapter 12. 
But notice he said the word commotions. Now, you take that word, you look it up, to my knowledge, one place in the Bible, and it's in Jeremiah chapter 10. I want you to notice this. Behold, the noise of the brute is come, and a great commotion out of the north country to make the cities of Judah desolate and a den of dragons. Now, think, here's what I want you to think about Judah. Judah was, of course, uh, the, the fourth son of Jacob and the tribe from which Jesus Christ came. Remember, he is the high priest of a priestly order, but because he was not from the tribe of Levi, there's no law here that accommodates a high priest from the tribe of Judah. All the high priests in the Old Testament were from Levi. So that signifies, Paul tells us in Hebrews, that signifies to us there's a new law. There's a new covenant going on because there's a new high priest. He's not from Levi. He's from Judah. So think about it. Judah being the fourth, Jesus Christ being the Son of God in the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So it pertains to the Gospel. And the cities of Judah, I sort of say, if you want to make a spiritual comparison to it, think of the churches, churches around the world. You could even think of nations that at one time were Christian nations. All you have to do is look at the flags of nations from around the world and find ones that have a cross in it. Okay? Now, America doesn't, but obviously we were a Christian nation. Great Britain with the Union Jack. A lot of the Scandinavian countries still have crosses in their flags. Do you know why? At one time, Calvinism was the primary religious ideology in a lot of Scandinavian countries. And they were very strict. They were Protestant, and they were very strict people. They lived a very strict, straightforward, you either serve God or else type of ideology. Now, these nations are some of the most liberal, and we're talking about, you know, you can be a prostitute at what, 14? Okay? Crazy stuff. Wicked stuff. So take that now and go back to this verse again. Behold, the noise of the brute is come. Do you know who the brute is? It's not Brutus from Popeye and olive oil. The brute is the beast. The noise of the beast is come. And a great commotion out of the north country. We just dealt with that series. We know what that means. To make the cities of Judah desolate and a den of dragons. The reason why the dragons move in is because Jesus Christ, the man, is not there. That's, and if you go back to the study I did years ago called uh, Where Dragons Live, several versions of it online that I've done, I've preached it in many places and so on. It's an eye opening thing to understand that devils move in it, the, the very moment you set aside Jesus Christ, the Word of God, out of your life devils move in. Why? Because he's not there anymore, and they're scared to death of him, because they know what he can do to them. He can throw them in the pit anytime he wants to, and he's going to. So the commotion, when, he, when Luke said, you shall hear of wars and commotions, Jeremiah 10, a great commotion is coming, the noise of the brute. You know what that's telling you? When you see those commotions, get ready, the beast is coming. It's coming out of the north, and he's coming, and he's coming to make all of the nations desolate of the word of God so the dragons can move in. Mm -mm -mm. Now let's look at rumors of wars. When people hear a rumor, you know, I heard a rumor. Is it true? How much, how much of the internet is rumor? People say, I, I read this on the internet. Oh, I believe it. It's on the internet. It's, it, it's from a, I, I've had people say to this to me. They'll send me an article from a guy that I know is absolutely beyond crazy insane. And 99% of the stuff he comes up with is a bald-faced lie. But it's right-wing 
stuff that everybody believes in anyway, so when he says it must be true. And people have said, oh, I trust this guy. He's a trusted source. Man, you got to believe what he says. He's on top of it all. And I'm just going, he's the biggest liar I've ever seen in my life. So the internet is full of rumors. Now, I don't know that that's exactly what this is talking about, okay? But let's look at what it says, Jeremiah 51, verse 44. And I will punish Bel, which is Baal, in Babylon, and I will bring forth out of his mouth that which he hath swallowed up. Stop right here. Think of Jonah. Jonah was in the, the Lord prepared a great fish to swallow up. Jonah. Jesus said, as Jonas was three days and three nights in the well's belly, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. The earth swallowed up Jesus. Did he come back out? Yes, he did. On the third day. And the third day is a time prophecy specifically for um, Israel. It's in um, Hosea chapter 6. Verse 1, come let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn and he will heal us. He has smitten and he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. In the third day, he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. We have that prophecy. We have the dry bones prophecy. We have prophecy, 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 prophecy all through the scriptures. Thank you, Lord. Uh, concerning the revelation, or excuse me, the resurrection of dead Israel. We know that. We know that Babylon swallowed up, Baal swallowed up Israel. And God's going to reach in there like David did the lamb who is in the mouth of the lion and save him out of the lion's mouth. Like it. I will bring forth out of his mouth that which he has swallowed up. And the nations shall not flow together anymore unto him. Yea, the wall of Babylon shall fall. Think Jericho is a type of that. My people, go ye out of the midst of her. Think of 2 Corinthians 6. Flee out of the midst. Come out from among her and be ye separate, God said. Flee out of the midst of Babylon, God said in Revelation. And deliver ye every man his soul from the fierce anger of the Lord. And lest your heart faint, and ye fear for the rumor that shall be heard in the land. A rumor shall both come one year, and after that in another year shall come a rumor and violence in the land. Notice this, ruler against ruler. Therefore, behold, the days come that I will do judgment upon the graven images of Babylon, and her whole land shall be confounded, and all her slain shall fall in the midst of her. Then the heaven and the earth and all that is therein shall sing for Babylon, for the spoilers shall come unto her from the north, saith the Lord. There's the north again. So we go back to this previous verse where it talked about the noise of the brood has come, great commotion out of the north country. And here Luke said wars and commotions. Matthew said wars and rumors of wars. So now we have a connection between the wars, the rumors of wars, and the commotions, all telling us from different passages in the Bible what that means. Remember, if you want to know what Matthew means, read some other place in the Bible. If you want to know what Revelation means, read the whole rest of the Bible. I see Revelation as sort of, you know, at a big, long textbook. In the back of it is always an index of keywords, ideas that the textbook presented. In the back of the book, there's an index telling you, okay, on such and such page, we talked about this. And on this page, we talked about that. You read the index, and you go in, okay, what page is that on? And you go back to the book and read what it said about it. And I see Revelation as an index to the whole rest of the Bible. Not just the book of Daniel, but all of it. That's where we get our understanding. So he says, the wall of Babylon shall fail. How many times did they circle around? Jericho, 13 times, one time a day, six, time, six days, seven times on the seventh day, that's 13. Revelation chapter 17 says, Mystery Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. 13 words because it's the 
number for rebellion. It's the number for Babylon herself. And Jericho is a type of that. And so the walls fall of Jericho, the walls fall at Babylon. That means God is ready to destroy her and her evil, wicked, adulterous influence in this world. Then, then he said in verse 46, lest your heart faint and you fear for the rumor. Um, God is telling us again here, don't let your heart melt. Don't let it faint. Now, the rest of the world, they're going to lose it. They are absolutely going to lose their mind. There's a picture I showed last week's PMO of a couple in St. Louis, very wealthy couple. He's a lawyer. They were doing one of these protests out in front of the liberal Democrat mayor of St. Louis. So they turn on each other. And her next door neighbors came all out with guns. The man was holding a gun. He was holding it right. It was, looked like an AR-15 or something like that. And he was calm, but his, his wife was like, she was holding a pistol, and she had her finger on the trigger, and she was like, oh, crazy guy, going, don't cover up my house, don't cover up my house. She was losing it, okay? Now, were they doing the right thing? Absolutely. Absolutely, they were doing the right thing. But God's telling us, don't lose it. In fact, he's not just telling us, you better not fear. I believe that when this comes, God's people, we might be afraid just enough to call upon our God. And then God is going to watch over us. We will not be afraid on that day. And then he, he mentions, when the rumor comes, you're going to hear it. And it will be ruler against ruler. Now, I'm going to make a point later about this. I've talked about this before. He didn't say rulers against rulers. He said ruler against ruler. And then he said, the spoilers shall come unto her from the north. Think of food rotting in the refrigerator. Because that's what spoilage is. That food is your food. And yet some species like penicillin, mold, decided that they were going to take over that food. Since you didn't eat it quick enough, they're going to steal it from you. So that's what all that green stuff is growing on the stuff in your refrigerator. It's We say, ooh, it's spoiled. And what that means is it's been taken. And mark it down. God said in Deuteronomy 28, he said in Leviticus 26, he said the spoilers are coming. They're going to come, they're going to steal your children, they're going to steal your cattle, they're going to steal your grain. What you plant with your hands, you're not going to get to eat it. They're going to eat it. And that day is coming to this world. It is a time of trouble, a day of trouble, and I believe it's part of the days of tribulation. Ezekiel chapter 7, verse 25. Destruction cometh, and they shall seek peace, and there shall be none. Mischief shall come upon mischief, and rumor shall be upon rumor. Think about what he's saying. We've got ruler against ruler, kingdom upon kingdom against kingdom, nation against na nation, mischief upon mischief, rumor upon rumor. Then shall they seek a vision of the prophet, but the law shall perish from the priest and counsel of, from the ancients. The king shall mourn, and the prince shall be clothed with desolation, and the hands of the people of the land shall be troubled. I will do unto them after their way, and according to their deserts will I judge them, and they shall know that I am the Lord. Now, what I believe about this passage, 
is I believe it's telling us that there is going to, that there's coming a time when this stuff starts happening, sort of like now, what I said earlier about only 30% of the churches back to having services again. And I think God is starting to divide sheep from goats. And I think during this time, God's people are going to know what's going on. They're going to know what's happening. They're going to know the word of God is going to be in them. Um, Wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of thy times. Isaiah 33, 6, I believe is what it is. But all of those who are playing church, all of those who said, you know, I'll wait some other time, get, get in church, get right with the man upstairs. I'll wait some other time for that. I, I'm not done partying. I've actually had people tell me that. Well, I think there's going to come a time when they're going to seek for wisdom from God, and God says, I'm not giving it to them. Because, probably, because they've been appointed under wrath. Now, God's a merciful God, and yes, I do believe God's going to save some people. But what are you waiting on? And what chance are you taking? Are you taking a chance that, you know, when all this stuff comes down, then I'll get right. God will surely, God will let me. Well, maybe he won't. Maybe he won't. Maybe he won't let you know what's going on. Maybe because you've chosen to believe all deceptions on the internet and not sought after his word, and you're waiting. Maybe God says to you, you know what? I'm not going to do it for you. A famine's coming, all right. It's going to be a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. Revelation chapter 6. Now, here's what I'm going to do is I'm going to tie in when he said, um, you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. I'm going to tie in what I believe is the connection between what Jesus said here and the opening of the seals in Revelation 6. And of course, we're going to pull in some other prophecies as well that I know are related to this particular number. Because understand, because when he said when the noise of the brute is come, that's the, the beast. The noise of the beast is coming. The beast is coming and the wars kicking all this off are what precipitates that. It's, what, it's sort of what brings his kingdom in. So we know that in Nebuchadnezzar's vision, he had the vision of the, the image that was divided up into four parts, the gold, the silver, the brass, the iron, and then the iron and the clay. And that iron and clay was the fourth kingdom, which has not appeared yet, but it's coming. So I believe we're going to see from the scriptures the things and they're we're given this number four, I believe, as a clue to show us what is it that's going to bring in this fourth kingdom. Now, I've never been in a war, a real war. I've fought spiritual battles. Those were hard. But I've never been a soldier in a, in a battlefield, nor... Have I ever lived in a city that's been bombed out of existence because of war? I, I study a lot, um, seem to be fascinated with World War II. Those um, soldiers who fought that are my heroes. There's not very many of them left. And when I, when I look at the newsreels and the films from those days, and I see the horror that war is for, for even the German people. I mean, because, because they elected a crazy madman to, to run their, their government, we basically had no choice. The Allies had no choice but to just 
practically carpet bombed their cities out of existence. Now, we did the right thing when the war was over. We went over there. We stabilized those countries. We tried to get their infrastructure built back, the bodies buried, tried to make sure the people that remained had enough food to eat, stabilized their governments, and then let them rule themselves. Okay, we did that in, in Germany. We did that with Japan as well. Okay, um, but the idea of being bombed every night and everybody you know dead the idea that at any moment bombs could drop on your house and you'd never know what hit you. You either are killed instantly or you're just buried alive and you're going to die because there's no one there to save you. War is a terrible, horrible, horrible thing. But it's coming. It's coming for sure. And one of the reasons why God... If you go study the book of um, Judges, the first three or four chapters, Joshua and his generation fought the wars to, to gain the land. So to them, that land was precious to them. But Joshua's an old man. He's like the World War II people. They're all dying off. And now in the book of Judges, God says, look, I told you to get rid of all the enemies, but you didn't do it. Now, I left those in there. I left some of those people there. Why did I do that? Because the generation that's now growing up, they hear stories about the war. They did not see the war. They didn't fight it. To them, this land is just that they're going to take it for granted. And unless they're taught how to fight for what they have, to keep what they have, They'll, they'll turn instantly, they will turn a generation of people basically into a bunch of spoiled brats that are just taking advantage and have everything given to them like what we see now. One of the problems with American youth right now is that everything's given to them and now it's a demand. They demand everything. That's why they're crying for communism and socialism. It's because they've never had to fight for what they had. They've never had to fight to keep the liberties that we're given. So a war is coming, and it's not going to be pretty. It's not. Now, God's going to help us. He's going to teach us how to get through these times, okay? But it's coming. So now, let's take this now and go to Revelation chapter 6. We're going to look at the four seals. Just like it's four gospels, which saves mankind, and it's Christ's kingdom coming to the earth. The flip side of that is the fourth kingdom, which dooms mankind. So here it is, Revelation 6, verse 1. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard as it were, the noise of thunder. One of the four beasts saying, come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse. This is a spirit now. We learned this from Zechariah. And I saw, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat on him had a bow. And a crown was given unto him. And he went forth conquering and to conquer. Verse 3, and when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. 
When he had opened the fourth seal, and remember, the fourth thing is always different from the other three, and you'll see it here. When he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse. And his name that sat on him was Death and Hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with, number one, the sword, number two, with hunger, number three, with death, number four, the beast of the earth. So let me point out some things before we move past this. Let me point out some things. Number one, this is Christ who is opening the seals. Remember, this is the book. It's the book that we've talked about. It's the book of DNA. It's the book, the book of the proof of who gets the land of Palestine, okay? Because the evidence is written in a book, and it's going to be, and it was sealed, and it's going to be opened up one of these days. So we know it represents a lot of things. But opening that book then shows us that all of these prophecies now are going to be unsealed, and now they're going to be ful fulfilled. Remember in Luke chapter 4, Jesus had been 40 days in the wilderness, and he had endured the temptation. He comes, and he goes into the synagogue, as his, was, was his custom. They gave him the book, Isaiah, the book, get it, 66 chapters, 66 books. And he opened the book, and he read a portion of it, closed it back, and he said, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. So the act of Jesus opening the book means that the things that are written therein are now going to be fulfilled. And that's what's going on here. So opens the first seal, white horse comes out. White horse, he's got a crown and he's got a bow in his hand. We talked about that last week. And it's not a, it's not a pretty rainbow. It's a weapon of war. It's a bow. And he means to, what is it that the American eagle holds in its talons on the back of our $1 bill? Arrows. 13 of them. Okay? Now, it holds in the other hand an olive branch with 13 olives on it. That means peace. But the 13 arrows means war. Because you only use arrows for one thing, people. So this beast comes out, the first beast comes out, the first rider, and he's going to conquer everything. The second one comes out. It's a, uh, what is it, the, the red horse, okay? He comes out, and all of a sudden, there's no peace on earth, no goodwill toward all men. He takes peace from the earth war. Then the third ride, the horse comes out the, and its rider, and um, he brings famine to the land. He's got a pair of balances and so on. Then remember, the fourth is always different than the other three. So you have a white horse, a red horse, a black horse. Those are all single colors. What color is pale? What color is that? You could say gray. In Zechariah, um, it gives us the word um, speckled and grizzled and bay horses. Okay? So they're like mixed colors. The fourth one's different. And remember, in the fourth kingdom, it's a mixed, divided kingdom. It's partly strong, partly broken. The grizzled and bay horses of Zechariah are partly one thing, partly another. So is this horse. Pale, I guess you could say gray. It's a combination of white and black mingled together. But it's significantly different it also in that it has two riders. Death and hell. 
just as we want the kingdom of heaven to come, here, hell's kingdom is about to take over the earth. And he takes the earth, or the fourth part of the earth, he kills the fourth part of all the people on the earth. One fourth of the earth's population is dead. And he does it with four things. Sword, hunger, death, beasts of the earth. Now, what do you think, because this four, what do you think that represents? When he says beasts of the earth and death and hunger and sword, do you think those are earthly things or do you think those are things from the realm of principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places? That's what I think. And did you know that this exact prophecy was given in the Old Testament as well? Did you know that? Let's turn there. Ezekiel chapter 14. Now, let me turn my Bible there. Um, it's hard to put like an entire chapter up on the screen for you. But Ezekiel chapter 14 is an interesting, interesting place. Um, this is, it starts out with, in Ezekiel 14, this is where the people of the guys of Israel, the elders, they come to Ezekiel and they say, inquire the Lord for us. We want to hear what God has to say. And God says to Ezekiel, see those guys? You can't see it, but I can. They've got idols in their heart. They've got idols hiding in their heart. They don't worship me. They worship these gods that they've set up in their heart. And God said, should I, should I be inquired of them? Should I hear their prayers? Should I answer them? Should I tell them the truth? No way, no how, God says. I'm going to answer them according to the abundance of the idols that are in their heart. And this is, I studied this here a couple of years ago because I wanted to know how people ended up being deceived. People who said they knew the truth ended up being deceived, just going off nuts. Young man that used to preach here, he's now preaching seventh day stuff, law keeping stuff. Got to keep the feast days. Got to call him Yahushua and all this stuff in order to be saved. How does that happen? It's in the heart, not the brain. You can think things rationally, logically, and say, okay, this is, this is what the Bible says, so I believe it. But then the heart gets deceived, and the heart always overrides the brain, doesn't it? You ever fell in love with somebody? The heart just overrides all logical thinking. And that's what happens. And God said, listen, when I speak to those people, it's going to be a barefaced lie. And we know how that works because in the days of Micaiah, Micaiah said he saw angels, he saw all the devils and spirits around heaven, and God said, Who, who's going to go and deceive Ahab for me? And this spirit said, I'll do it. God said, how are you going to do it? He said, I'm going to be a lying spirit in the mouth of all of his prophets. And God said, you got the job. And Ahab believed what those prophets told him. It was a lying spirit spirit. And so God says to these people, I'm just going to, they're going to believe I said something. They're going to think it's from me, but it's going to be a bold-faced lie. Because they don't worship me. They don't worship anything near me. And I won't let them have the truth. Remember, we just read that earlier. Now, beyond that, he says, uh, let's pick it up in verse 12. I had that up on the screen. The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Son of man, when the land sinneth against me by trespassing grievously. You know, like gay pride parades, killing innocent babies and abortion. Then will I stretch out my hand upon it, will break the staff of the bread thereof, and will send famine upon it. And will cut off man and beast from it. And then he said, Though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, saith the Lord God. If I cause noisome beasts to pass through the land, and they spoil it so that it be desolate, that no man may pass through because of the beasts. Though these three men were in it, as I live, saith the Lord God, and he referenced Noah, Daniel, and Job, 
They shall deliver neither sons nor daughters. They only shall be delivered, but the land shall be desolate. Now, isn't it interesting? He picks three. Noah. Is Noah saved from God's great wrath? Yep. Was Daniel delivered from the roaring lions? Yes. Job? Was Job delivered when the devil himself attacked first his family and all of his wealth and then attacked his physical body? Was Job delivered? Yes. He mentions three. How many were in the fiery furnace? Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. Who was with them? The Son of God. Okay? So I think this is related to that. And here's what, what God is saying here. When I delivered Noah and his family, now Noah may have had brothers and sisters and first cousins and aunts and uncles and even his own father, Lamech, his grandfather, Methuselah. We know by the dates that Methuselah died the same year the flood started. Did he die in the flood? Don't know. But God didn't spare him. Not at all. So God's saying, you know, like with Daniel and Job, he had his three friends trying to tell him, curse God, die, get it over with. God cursed those guys and blessed Job. So what he's saying here is, when all this stuff kicks loose, do you think that because you're related to somebody who reads the Bible that automatically you're going to get spared? Absolutely not. You think that because you go to first so-and-so church and half of those people in there are born again, that because you're a member of that church, you're going to be spared? Not a chance. God doesn't work that way. You've got a chance now to get right with God. You've got a chance now to ask God to start delivering you from sins and transgressions that so easily beset us. You've got a chance now to do that, and you won't do it. You think that because you voted for Trump that God's going to save you? No. Do you think that because you know all the conspiracy theories and and uh, you read up on them every day and you're against the new world order that you won't go get the money? No. I've said this hundreds of times, maybe fifties of times. But I'm going to keep saying it. Just because you research all the conspiracy theories doesn't mean that you can't be deceived. Because along all that time you spend reading the conspiracy theories while you're on the internet, what are, you, what are your other browsers up to? Right? So don't think that that's going to save you, because it won't. Then verse 17, or if I bring a sword upon that land and say, sword, go through the land so that I cut off man and beast from it. Though these three men were in it, as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither sons nor daughters, but they only shall be delivered themselves. Or if I send a pestilence into that land and pour out my fury upon it in blood to cut off from it man and beast. Though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, as I lived, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither son nor daughter. They shall but deliver their own souls by their righteousness. For thus saith the Lord God, how much more when I send my four sore judgments upon Jerusalem, the sword, the famine, the noisome beast, and the pestilence to cut off from it man and beast. Did you see that? Four sore judgments. Sword, famine, noisome beast, pestilence. If we go back to Revelation 6, it's almost identical. Sword, 
hunger, famine, death, pestilence, beasts of the earth. Even though it says it's slightly different, remember it's like the two eyes looking at the same thing from a different direction. So you got two witnesses, one Old Testament, one New Testament, and I think they match perfectly. They are the two witnesses together that's telling us what's going to happen. And each one of them has a, a slightly different way of looking at it, but it's the complete picture. It gives us the depth of it. And it also gives us the idea that not very many people are going to be saved when all of this really happens. Again, how many churches are there in the United States of America? There's dozens in every town in America. Dozens. And out of all of those, at best, less than a third of them are able to hold decent services. I think God is shelling out the corn, we used to say. He's pulling the husks off, getting the silk off of it, shucking it down to the cob, okay? Separating wheat from chaff, separating sheep from goats. That's one way of doing it, sure enough. Now, if this scares you, remember, what is it that uh, between Noah, Daniel, and Job that marks all three of them? In other words, what's the common bond? They're all Old Testament. Now, oh, you're missing it. They all believed God. They trusted. They had faith. They were saved by faith. God rescued them. God spared them. God blessed them because they trusted God. And again, I wouldn't, would not want to see the ravages of what a war would look like in this land. Remember, this nation has not seen a war fought in it since the 1860s, since the Civil War. We don't even know what that would look like here. But we have enough enemies out there now that would love to see one take place. And would God let, allow that to happen in this nation? The nation who's already turned its back on God, the nation who has murdered and untold Old millions of innocent babies? A nation where people are so warped in their minds that we can't even say that there's a difference between a man and a woman. You think God would allow a war in this country? It's almost guaranteed. So we could either be scared and say to the devil, I don't, I'm, I'm too afraid. I don't want a war. Don't, don't hurt me and I'll, I'll follow you. Or we could say, God, I'm very afraid. Will you save me? That's all you got to do. And God will do it. Psalm 27. Though an host should camp in camp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. Confident has the word fide in it, and it means faith, with faith. I'll be confident in this, though a host encamp about me. And I'm telling you, right now, I, I do. I feel like lions are all around me. Okay? All around my church, all around my family. So I'm doing warfare. Even right now I'm doing it. Psalm 91. 
one of my favorite places in the Bible. Beautiful. This is, remember, Psalm 91's the part of the Bible that the devil tried to whoop out on Jesus. Now, let me show you what the Bible says. Remember that? While Jesus was fasting in the world. Hey, Jesus, jump, jump off of there. Angels will come get you. No, doesn't work that way. That's tempting the Lord God. There was a part that the devil just didn't read. He just missed that part. Psalm 91, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. That's one of the things that's coming, isn't it? Pestilences. And He shall cover thee with His feathers and under His wings shalt thou trust. Then it tells you what all that is. His truth, which is his word, shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt, let me explain. The shield is, you know, what you hold here. The buckler, the things that you buckle onto your arms and shoulders. So you got a sword in this hand, but that leaves you, if you're going to use the sword, that leaves your arm sort of stuck out there. So they used to take, you know, leather or steel or whatever, and they used to buckle it here, buckle it here on their shoulders in case they get hit in the shoulders with their sword arm. So there was protection for this arm with a shield and protection with their sword arm with bucklers. Get that? I love I love this Bible. Meaning... He's going to be both of those, our shield and our buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day. What's the devil trying to throw at us? Fiery darts or arrows, same thing. Nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high, Thy habitation. Remember, we live in Christ. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. There is now therefore no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. We literally, it's like living in the ark. We literally abide inside him. I mean, and that's how, that's how God then sees us as holy. I mean, he looks on us and he knows there's sin. We've, we've got sin. We've sinned. We've disobeyed. We've transgressed. But now we're in Christ. So when he sees us, who does he see? Christ. And he does not condemn Christ. Amen. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high thy habitation, there shall now there shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Thou shalt tread all oh, this is the part that the devil didn't read. Jesus could have said, uh, devil, why, why don't you read the rest of that? You know what that says? Thou shalt tread upon the lion 
an adder, the young lion, and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. Because he has set, now this is God talking to us. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high because he hath known my name. And he shall call upon me, and I will answer him. And I will be with him in, there it is, trouble. And I will deliver him and honor him with long life. Will I satisfy him and show him my salvation? Hallelujah. Somebody say amen. I love this. God's going to deliver his people. He said, you're going to see it with your eyes. But I won't let it happen to you. I won't let them destroy you. Because you have made the most high thy habitation. Because you've decided to dwell in, to dwell in Christ. Being in Christ means being in your Bible. Means that this book is not just some Reader's Digest thing that you look at every now and then. And it's not just something that you use every now and then on a meme. It's something that is part of your life. And there's no detaching it from your life. Nobody's going to do that. You've made this book your habitation. You live here. Devil wants to know where to find you? You'll find me here, devil. And because of that, God said, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to satisfy you. I'm going to keep you. And nothing, even when you close your eyes at night, nothing is going to harm you tonight. Now, folks, again, it's wonderful to read these verses and to say, yes, I believe them. But, of course, right now, we don't have people running at us with guns and bombs and tanks wanting to blow us to bits or whatever. But I promise you, on the day that it comes and you think that you're going to be afraid and you're trying to talk yourself out of being afraid, but it's not working too well, is it? I promise you, you're not going to be afraid. I promise you, you won't. Not even, not even if, if God, let me say it this way, not even if God blesses you with the blessing of letting them take your life, being persecuted, being smitten for Jesus, not even then will you be afraid. Now, I said that to say this. There's a war coming. And who's it against? I've said before, the scripture says, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, ruler against ruler. Not kingdoms against kingdoms. It's not World War III. I believe that it's a particular kingdom against another particular kingdom. What two kingdoms really are there? God's kingdom and hell's kingdom. Kingdom of heaven, kingdom of hell. So, the kingdom of hell is going to fight against the kingdom of heaven. Well, what makes up the kingdom of heaven? We do. So watch this. Daniel chapter 7. Verse 19, then I would know the truth of the fourth beast. Remember the four sword judgments and the four seals and the principalities and the powers and the rulers of darkness and spiritual wickedness in high places and the fourth king, the four sword judgments. Remember all that? Okay. Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse from all the others, exceeding dreadful whose teeth were of iron, his nails of brass, which devoured, break in pieces, and stamped the residue with his feet. And of the ten horns that were in his head, that's Revelation 13, 
And of the other which came up and before whom three fell, even of that horn that had eyes and a mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellow, I beheld, and the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. Now, I have a theory on why some people don't want to believe that we as Christians go through anything. We're going to be raptured out before anything happens. What they do is, any, with that, any mention of the saints, well, that's Israel. That's the Jews. To me, it's very anti-Semitic. It, it says that the Jews deserve the beast to eat them up, but we don't. To me, it's very, who does, who does Jesus actually love more than us? The Jews. Okay? I mean, who, what is salvation? Salvation's of the Jews. Who did Christ die for first? To the Jew first. But they say that all this reference to the saints, that's Israel. We, that's not for us. We don't have to worry about that. That's not, he's not against us at all. That's not, that's not biblical. Are we not the saints, the living God, saints of the most high God? I could prove that to you, or you could do it yourself. Pure Bible Search software, purebiblesearch.com, download it, and type in the word saint or saints. Find out who it is. Okay? But notice he makes war with the saints and prevailed against them. Now, that happens now. That happens now. Saints die, don't they? Saints die. Well, in a way that's, you know, sin conquering a saint. But when sin conquers a saint, what happens? The saint shakes it off, gets back up, right? Because death's not permanent with us. It happens now when the devil tempts us and we succumb to that temptation. We fight it, but he prevails against us sometimes, doesn't he? Okay, so you can kind of see that, yeah, it does kind of happen now, doesn't it? So is there going to come a time when God, and, and obviously, if the beast, the Antichrist, 666, man of sin, Satan's son, if he prevails over any of God's people, whether they're Jew or Gentile or both, who allows it? God. Did, the, did a beast system prevail over Peter? Yep. Did it prevail over Paul? Yep. James? Mm -hmm. The other disciples? Yeah. They tried it with John. Didn't work. John died of old age. But it happens. Revelation 13, double witness. Verse 6, he opened his mouth and blasphemed me against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Look at that again. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. I remember the first time I read that, I went. Because... We're the saints, and why does God allow that to happen? He has his reasons, and I, I believe they're all biblical. I think just to, I don't have time to get into it today, but I, I think it has something to do with God's going to allow the man of sin to kill his people so God can say, okay, I'm coming to get you now, buddy. Something like that, all right? So let me read some more verses that might help you feel better. 
about what's coming. 2 Corinthians 10, 3, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. 2 Corinthians 10, 4, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. 1 Timothy 1, 18, this charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. 2 Timothy 2, 4, no man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. See, I, again, I've never fought a war, never fought for my country. But I would. I would. And, you know, I shared this story about my cousin defending his uh, gun store against Antifa. And when the Antifa scouts kept driving ba back and forth, seeing that him and his about half a dozen or more of his buddies were standing out there with, you know, semi-automatic rifles or maybe fully automatic, I don't know. They decided that it, it wasn't a good day to die, so they just moved on. And I told my cousin, you know what the difference is between them and us? With them, they have a philosophy that they've been fed in socialism class in, co in college. And I said, they're paid by George Soros to start all this trouble. They're not willing to die for it, though. Guarantee you that. They're not willing to scale the uh, outer wall around the White House to prove their point, because they know they would have got shot down. And I said, the difference between them and us is that we're willing to give our life for what we believe in. They're not. All they want to do is live as long as they can, escape death. But to us, death is victory. So yeah, even though the, I mean, the beast, even, my goodness, I just thought of this. In uh, Revelation, it's an old Bible. Revelation 11, the two witnesses, right? The two witnesses whom God himself picks to prophesy three and a half years. And they have power. If they say there's going to be a famine, there's going to be a famine. Okay, nothing can touch them. And yet the beast that rises up out of the pit has them killed. So if you think that we're beyond being killed for Jesus, think again. But what happens three and a half days later? Boing! Rise up from the dead. See, that's just it with God. Death is something that to us is victory. What are we waiting for? What do we get saved for? Because we knew eventually we were going to die. And I've already decided how I want to die. I want to die giving my life for what I believe in, for what I, what I do every day to defend what I do every day. That's how I want to die. Now, it's up to God how he's going to take me out. But that's how I want to do it. So with that mindset, let's become soldiers. Amen? Let's be good soldiers. Don't ever forget your sword. Don't ever forget your shield. You're going to need it. I love you. You're the reason why I do what I do. We thank you so much. And you're being a blessing to us. We hope we can always be a blessing to you. Pray for us. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.